Okay, so it is time and once again, hello everyone and thank you for uh, thank you for joining my forum. Uh, so the topic of this forum is uh, identity crisis and addiction, which is going to be explored in terms of robotics, AR and VR and video games. <clears throat> so to, uh, I hope, well, this is more of a, yeah, it's a, it's, sorry, I guess somebody speak, somebody's microphone is on, please. I would kindly ask you to mute yourself and yeah. I'm sorry, whose mic is on? Okay. All right. So this is more of a forum slash personal research on um, various reasons or various, more of a various reasons why people are getting addicted to consuming content or consuming technology and how we should look at the new technologies that are shaping our everyday lifestyle. So to shortly introduce myself, I'm currently studying psychology in Columbia University. And, <clears throat> oh, sorry, my name is Chan Young Huang. Uh, you can call me Jay. I'm currently serving in New York Emanuel Church for, uh, as a part of the broadcast team. And also, uh, I'm currently staying in Korea due to, well, hold the situation with the, uh, you know what, and serving in Seoul Emanuel Church in a, um, in a global, global mission department. And also I'm a team member of fourth uh, industrial revolution summit training team of New York y -Bomb. And I must give them a shout out because uh, they are the one who have provided this opportunity to uh, make all make all this happen. And currently, I'm a part time video editor. Um, before, well, during my leap years, I worked as an assistant project manager in a Korean gaming company called Pearl Biz, uh, which is in charge. Which is currently, well, I hope somebody has heard the name the, of the game called Black Desert, which is serve it's still being serviced online and on mobile okay let's uh let's continue so my cvdip current is uh well my covenant is isaiah 43 21 the restoration of the true church culture and uh, my vision is first chronicle 71 14 not by me but by but but by the power of god uh, my dream is ezekiel 37 and 37, 1 to 14, to be the one who delivers the word of life to uh, the people fallen on their fields like dry bones. And my image is 1 Kings 19, 10 to 12, to not be distracted by the flame or by the earthquake or other natural or big things that make me intimidate of this world, but to continue, but to focus only on the gentle whisper that God provides me. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the first topic, which is robotics. And I would like to begin with a short video clip about the latest um, application of robotics that some of you might have expected, but I hope most of you haven't thought of. All right, can In you a dimly all lit hear temple, the sound? Worshippers gather yeah. to listen to ancient Great. Buddhist teachings delivered by a robot. The robot introduces itself as the Buddhist goddess of mercy. According to faith, this deity can appear in any form. The robotic preacher is known as Minda. It's the brainchild of temple steward Tensho Goto, who's hoping to bring worshippers closer to the divine. Many Buddhist statues have been made. 
But they were all just Buddhist images, standing or sitting figures. I wanted to create a Buddhist statue which can speak, make eye contact, and answer questions so that people can feel closer to it. Temple officials say Minda has proven a hit with the crowds, despite initial skepticism. All right, so yeah, um, I hope that video was quite disturbing for all of you, all of you here. And the reason why I'm sharing this video is um, basically it's the thing that we can do, but we don't want to do. We there are a lot of things that we don't want. Uh, to be replaced by robot in our life, but um, actually the list goes a little further than we thought. And the reason why we're feeling disturbed by th such things is that it steps on the boundary of what of the things that we consider ourselves as unique beings, as humans. Uh, but just to think about what the definition of the robots is just any kind of machine, any kind of machine that is programmed to automatically perform a certain task. And with the complexity and the development level of development in, in current technology with programming and, of course, engineering. Basically, we can say that all of the jobs, all of the professions that we do are replaceable. Of course, there's some um, defects on the current level, but we are expecting that uh, those, well, those uh, tasks will be perfected sooner or later. And currently the robots are classifiable in these two categories mostly, a versatile ones and specialized. Uh, so on your left, you have a versatile robot named Spot uh, developed by Boston Dynamics in America, which is used in various tasks to uh, deliver goods or anything that requires movements and delivery. So on the left down corner, you have a picture of Spot walking down the park in Singapore, which is used to warn people who are not, uh, who are not adhering to the social distancing. So this is taken in this year, like a few months ago. Like, so Singapore government is using these robots so they could remotely con um, make people to follow the social safety. Of course, and, but it was at first designed to like help in like construction sites or different kinds of uh, fields that require delivery. And on the right, you have specialized robots that are that can perform only a certain task because they're built that way and programmed that way, like Roomba, which cleans our uh, bedrooms or uh, our floors. And uh, on the right down corner, you have Yumi, which is a robot barista. But let's think about why do we make robots? Why do we have even robotics? Uh, I personally think that the most perfect example for the development of robotics is Iron Man. Like, think about Tony Stark. Tony Stark is just a person, right? Just a person, just the same person as we are. Well, of course, he's incredibly rich and smart, but that's a different thing. However, only when he wears his armor made of robot, made of small robots, he can be as powerful as any other superhumans in the movie. And that's the basically the reason why we're building robots. They are, yes, they replace the jobs that we can do, or more specifically saying, replace the jobs other people do, 
that we need. Using robots, one person can be as powerful as group of people. But with that kind of development, another advance in the field of robotics is the social field of social robotics. What does that mean? We replace our companions with robots because we all need um, some kind of relationship in our life, right? We all need some kind of, not even people, some beings to help or assist us in a, in a, in a complex situations. And uh, with the, well, with the various problems that are like emerging in the latest uh, time in our life, we have so many jobs that needs to be filled with people, but we don't have enough people. For example, uh, on the, like, you guys can see my cursor on the screen, right? Right here, we have a social robots for seniors and disabled people, which helps them physically in the times when they cannot move or when they need some assistance regarding some of uh, their limitations. And also on, the, on this corner down here, we have a robot teacher that helps to teach uh, the people, the children with special needs like autism, because people get tired. Even though we are so made as we are made as warm as um, care caring people, we are made as caring uh, creatures. But we get tired of caring people. We have physical limitations on it but we still have those jobs that need to be filled 24 hours. So what's the, pro what's the solution? Replace them with advanced robots. All right, let's... So in, we, uh, we can summarize the whole field of robotics in one sentence. Using robots, we expand the domain of our physical ability. Uh, and that means that we expand what one person can do. Then from that point, let's move on to the next technology, AR and VR. And we have another video um, that may be, well, as complex. I'm not sure, but it shows the latest things, we, what we can do with VR technology. So we have a mother who has lost her child. I don't want to meet my child. I want to see how I can see it. Are you ready to go? Yes. Okay, so one question here. Do you think that smile was a lie? Do you think the smile was fake? No, right? That was a genuine smile of a mother who saw her lost daughter. And you might ask, is that that simple? I mean, are we that deceivable? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. She was physically in a VR studio, but well, her body was in the VR studio, but her mind was in a different place with her daughter. And that's basically what VR is about. You mix the real world or you overlay the information and the virtual incentives that you want, that you like, that you prefer on the real world. And in, the, in such way, you make the world that is customized only for you. I mean, well, it, it sounds very complex, but it's actually pretty common, pretty prevalent in our life already. Like, um, shortly to, to, uh, to talk about how this thing works, we basically 
our feelings, our perceptions, um, how how we sense stuffs are very easy to deceive. Like you guys did those kinds of tricks when you like um, put eyes on, put fingers in front of your eyes, and you see a flying sausage between your eyes, like those kinds of stuff, right? Or or maybe you have play with some magic eye stuff that uh, that you trick your eyes and you see three D images uh, from the books, or you may, uh, some of you may have already has, uh, well, played with VR entertainment. But anyhow, just by showing two different images that are slightly from different angle, our brain will process it our, uh, into, a three, into a complete 3D. That's how, our, that's how our brain is built and that's how our brain works. And if you can deceive our vision, you can basically deceive around like 70, 80% of our senses because we're so dependent on what we see. And we, uh, what we see becomes what we believe. And what we believe becomes what we feel and vice versa. What we feel affects what we believe and what we believe affects what we see. Uh, this might be a little diff difficult for some of you guys, but Let's look at here. So how many of you played Pokemon Go? <laughs> how many of you played Pokemon Go while we were allowed to go to the street safely? I mean, personally, I also did. And I still remember that I was just looking on my screen and walking down the streets and to, to, capture, to capture a Charmander. And I found myself in, a, in the middle of the graveyard. Yeah. Because even though even though you're looking at stuff on your screen, but you're distracted by the by the Pokemon on your screen, right? You don't care much of other things. They, uh, those Pokemons, do not exist in our real world, but it exists in your world, in the world that you see and you feel. The personal world. And that's basically the biggest market for VR technology right now, it, entertainment. But the next technology uh, application is medicine. And how does that work? Uh, medical students wear VR gears to enter a virtual operation room, and they can practice their operation on the virtual patients. What does that mean? They can gather experience on on operating without killing the actual patients. Think about how, how amazing is that? Basically, they can perform as many surgeries as real doctors do, but without killing anyone. They can be so skillful when they finish the education. Another field is marketing. Um, if you have a free time, then try to use an application called IKEA Home. Like it helps you to uh, like measure the size of the room and place the furniture on the actual on, in the room to actually feel how does it looks like. Of course, they, the, the furnitures do not exist in the real world, but you can scan them, you can see them on your screen. And another for educational purposes, I, I really recommend you to try uh, Civilization VR app. Uh, Civilization AR app made by BBC. That's basically a virtual museum in your room. And it's pretty fun. You can have an actual Egyptian sarcophagi in your in your room. That's pretty cool. Uh, anyhow, the meaning of the VR and AR technology is to change how we communicate, change how we interact with people, how we feel the world, how we see the world, by uh, adding some virtual data that we like, that we prefer, that we want to have. And what will happen if robotics is combined with AR and VR? So in this video, we have a farmer who is using drones to scan the orchard. Or, uh, so he's scanning uh, the status of each tree with the drones. And the drones pick up the what trees are well basically sick uh, they can they can analyze the harvest in real time and if you have enough amount of drones then they can even pick the fruits pick, pick the harvest for you basically using the drones and vr you can see you can 
to do, you can be, you can act as a group of people, even though you're one person. That sounds pretty amazing, right? I am a, I am a swamp thing. Like I am, I am an army. I am one man army. But let's think. So basically, we can say that AR VR is like expanding the domain of our mental ability, what we perceive. And uh, keeping that in mind, let's move on to the next example of video games. That what I really want to talk about. And as we continue, so let's talk about some real issues regarding it. And please, while you're listening to it, please think about what is the connection between the technologies I'm presenting, the robotics, AR, VR, and video games. All right, so let's begin some good news for you guys. Some say like video games destroy your brain. You don't, you must not play it. Like it's, it makes you dumber. And thankfully it's false. It's a uh, fake news. Who said that is a, uh, well, professor, Japanese professor Akio Mori in Nihon University. And his book that video game destroys your brain was uh, nominated for the most outrageous book in Japan in 2003. The reason for that is that he analyzed the data wrong and he made the, well, premature conclusion. And basically that theory that uh, destroying your brain with video games was never supported by any other scholar in the world. So, well, you can probably say your parents about it. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, actually the latest research has showed that video games might benefit you. So the research uh, conducted by Columbia University and University in Paris showed that uh, students who are spending time on video games actually showed more uh, higher intellectual functioning, higher overall school competence, and higher mental health and cognitive and social skills. And Professor uh, Dong Hua in uh, Professor Kang in the Samsung Hospital made a well. He personally made research showing that playing star strategic games like StarCraft may enhance your visual and intellectual skills. And the Cornell University has made a research that using video games actually can help to cure depression for elderly people. Like four weeks of game therapy is as effective as 12 weeks of medication. That's pretty amazing, right? And of course, there's another thing like video games makes you violent, but uh, the study between uh, conducted by Rutgers University with United States Census Bureau says there's no correlation between them. I mean, video game, sales, video game sales are rising as much as they can, but you don't see the case of assaults, case of crime, crime rates rising as that much. And also the thing, violent, some say violent contents make you, makes, make you numb to violence. So, so watching or playing a lot of violent contents makes you uh, easier to be violent. That's actually true, but that applies not only to video games, but to movies and TV shows as well. So, uh, well, yeah, watching Netflix, like Game of Thrones or something is as same as playing violent video games to your brains. And uh, another thing, like what is the biggest sport event in the world currently? Uh, it has been National Football League. It has been Super Bowl. Now it's League of Legends. League of Legends is officially bigger than Super Bowl since 2019. So what does that mean? So I can play as long as I want. It's not that harmful. Of course not. Of course not. Well, of course, you're unless you're training to become a professional player. That's actually hard, you know. It's not about like video games are good, video games are bad, no. It's the fact is that you cannot ignore them anymore. You cannot make the world, world without video games anymore. You cannot, and it applies for all the technologies I've, I have introduced. You cannot make the world without robotics and the AR, VR. They are not going to leave. You have to use them. 
video game industry is now bigger than Hollywood. And with the, with the lockdowns due to COVID-19, uh, people are well struggling from the boredom. So they are searching for more video games, more movies, more VR contents, and so on. Then we must ask the question, what is the connection between these three technologies? Why am I making these connections? The real play, yeah, real problem between these, all of these things is addiction, right? I guess all of you, no, well, not all of you, yeah, that's a generalization, but majority of you had this experience, like one more round, one more game, and I'll go to sleep, and it's 4 a.m., it's 5 a.m., you cannot go to sleep anymore. You completely just lose the balance of life. So now we have to think about why then people crave such things, why people want such things, why people get addicted to such things. And the reason is simple, instant gratification. You, well, uh, you, when you play the video games or when you, when you enjoy those kind of contents or robotics, then you can uh, get satisfaction much, much easier than in the real world. And uh, you can escape from reality that has so many problems and be in a, in a different reality for a second, for a short time. And uh, you have new identity. You have new, your, new yourself in the virtual world. Like when you play video games, the character that you're moving is not you, but it's still you. You, you feel as they move, well, at least partially. And this is the cartoon that I really like about when I explain about why kids like video games. It's uh, that asks uh, the daughter, why are you playing so much video games? And daughter says, I like video games because video uh, in the video games, you get rewards even you're at a last place, even when you lose. And that does not happen in the real world. Uh, to be rewarded for being for losing, I mean, yeah, it's a. Uh, it, we say that that this generation is having so much severe competition, and we are very hard, difficult to get gratification, get satisfaction from what we do. A feeling of achievement is lost in this generation, and actually, that's. A question for all of us like for kids for students for even for the elderly people who are for preparing for the retirement of course they want to find something that can satisfy uh, them with the lost sense of achievement uh, in in instance that's why video games are so popular that's why vr contents are the next new thing and let's talk about addiction from a more psychological viewpoint. So there is a famous experiment, experiment called Red Park. So you have two, we have a cage with two bottles, one bottle with a pure water and one bottle with a water diluted with cocaine. And we have two types of rats. Rats who are caged alone in the dark. And we have, on a, we have a different types of rats. Rats who are, in enjoying in a specially built cage called Red Park. They can play there, they can uh, communicate with their friends. It's basically like an amusement park for rats. So they can have as much as fun they can and have a social uh, interaction. Uh, the research showed that all rats that were caged alone in the dark got overdosed with cocaine. But the rats in the Red Amusement Park on the contrary, they used uh, this cocaine water only for a few times, and basically none of them got overdosed of it. That's, that sounds strange, right? We heard that cocaines and drugs are so addictive that from one instance, you'll get addicted. Well, the, so the conclusion, the meaning of the research is that if somebody, if the person feels himself safe, in a warm environment, 
with uh, enough social relations that can um, feel him connected, that makes him feel connected, then the, the, the possibility, the danger of being addicted to drugs or any other addictive things drops significantly lower. In other words, if you get all those satisfactions that make you complete, make you feel complete, you don't have to search for things to get addicted. But that's for rats, that's for animals that can be easily satisfied. Now, what about people? What about humans that are spiritual beings? And before we jump on the next stuff, let's talk about the reward system. So there's another experience, experiment with the rats uh, with the electrode directly connected to the part of the brain that releases dopamine. Dopamine is a, a hormone that controls our motivation and emotion and satisfaction. Uh, and uh, the, the cage was built that if, if the red presses the lever, then it activates the simulator and makes the electrode to release the dopamine forcefully. And what happened? The rat pressed the lever until he died, until it died. Just kept pressing the lever without eating, without drinking, without sleeping. That's how addictive our hormones are. That's how addictive our brains are built. Then what's the connection with that with video games? When you play video games, uh, the, the, the satisfaction from winning, satisfaction from victory, is as powerful as the victory in the real world. You get, over, you get the overdrive with dopamines and other hormones that makes you feel satisfied. So when you're not satisfied in the world, you come back to video games. You win, you get the satisfaction, and your brain gets used to that high level of dopamine. Then what happens? Everything else gets bored because you cannot get it adrenaline rush as in the video games. And uh, so continuing on that, there was a research case study made by uh, Professor Zhang in Kwangdook University of Korea. So uh, he observed uh, families with video, video game addicted kids for four years. And the conclusion that was made in the research was that uh, odds of being addicted was significantly higher in the families that ignore children or with extremely high pressure from the children, from the parents, right? And, or in the, in the families that parents or kids struggle from high anxiety or depression. In those cases, the kids were uh, more likely to be addicted with the video games and have less self-control. And you might have, so then just take away video games. He did. And what that showed is that those kids who got deprived of video games, those kids who got taken away with the video games, they just did nothing. They just, and some kids just watched YouTube all day. Some kids just kept sleeping. Some kids just kept just doing nothing. So it cannot be the true solution of the problem then we must go deeper. We must go deeper to find out where to begin with. And basically, addiction is just the tip of the iceberg. Addiction is expression of all the spiritual problems, all the old problems that has been kept in the deep layers in our mind, in our brain. And so, we are just searching for the outlet to satisfy ourselves, to relieve ourselves. And from what that begins with? From the question of who am I? From the question of your identity. And uh, from the first lecture in RCA, we have, uh, we have talked about like, well, Pastor, you talked about the things on relating to the identity, right? Who the remnants must be. The remnants must be mm -hmm. the ones that can um, exist on their own, that can be, that can perform 
as well as they were uh, when they are alone. They can survive when they're alone. What does that mean? They must know their identity. They must have a firm uh, grasp on their identity. And that's the that's the point. What uh, that's the point of different uh, that makes difference between the people who get addicted, or and the people who who cannot get addicted. You get addicted because you feel some kind of deficiency in your life. And the thing that makes you addicted helps you to forget those things, or or helps you to feel that they 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 those things fill that empty hole in your life in other words if you have if you struggle from the spiritual and mental anxiety you have a higher possibility of getting addicted that comes from the fundamental question uh, that, com that 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 builds everything is when you ha don't have the sense of identity when you're or when your eye sense of identity is so weak, eventually that you lose the interest and you cannot find your purpose in your life. So you want to compensate that with other things. And from that point, I wanted to bring out uh, the Bible verse First uh, Samuel 2 to 22 to 25, which talks about how Eli, uh, pro not prophet, priest, priest Eli condemns his sons for doing wrong things that cannot be done as uh, sons of the priest. And actually, this is the Bible verse that Pastor Yu brought out when he uh, gave, a lecture, gave a sermon on video game addiction. Why is that? Eli and his sons did not know what they were doing wrong. Eli did not know what his sons were doing at all. He heard that his sons were doing wrong things from other people. He, even though he was the father, he did not know what was happening until other people let him know. And his sons also did not know that they were doing wrong, that they're sinning against God. What does that mean? They didn't have enough communication, that they, they didn't talk about what is wrong or right in the eyes of God. They didn't, they didn't talk about why they follow God. In one word, they did not know their identity. And they were not even interested in it. Eventually, that applies to this modern, modern world as well. If you don't know your identity, you begin to question, who am I? And from that, you struggle to find your identity. So, because you have the questions of identity, it makes, it, it makes you to feel bored because you don't know what to do. You don't, you don't know what you like. So you begin to search for things that, that makes you feel fun, that, that maybe you get, interest, you get interested in. And eventually that leads you to choose the contents that you want to enjoy. So basically, if you study carefully, if you look at, uh, if you look carefully on the things what you consume, what you eat, what you watch, what you play, what you listen, you can make an analysis on things, what you want to be, what you like, what you are, who you are. So that is why I wanted to I wanted you to bring out the connection between robots, games, and AR VR contents, but not from the view uh, viewpoint of consumers, firstly from the viewpoint of the makers who make those things. When you make a video game, you have to act like God. Actually, you have to be the God in that virtual world. You have to begin from landscapes, from, from building, actually building the earth 
and you have to make the physical laws to happen. Like you can mess up, mess around with the gravity. You can mess around with the, how many eyes or legs will, you will have, how many, what kinds of rules apply, how many genders would be in that world. What is the history of the world? What is the sound? What is the visuals and so on? When you have those kinds of ability, what does, what does it make, make you to happen? You unconsciously bring out your spiritual background to the virtual world. You, as you make the world, as you make the virtual world, you are, well, you're people, you tend to do things that you like. So basically you fill the world with the things that you like and what does those preferences come from? From the spiritual background, from the spiritual roots. But how about the users? Let's think about how many games in the world, like thousands, millions. But there are specific games that you like and specific games you don't like. Same for the movies. There are, there are tons of movies in the world, but they, there's, there's movies that you like and there's the movies that everybody likes, but you don't. Or opposite, that's, that you like, but everybody hates it. Why is that? It talks to you. It gets connected to you. What does that mean? The need, the status, and the problem that maker of that content had applies to you as well. As you have the same spiritual background, you get connected and you like that. So from that point, let's, uh, let's uh, think about again why people want or need robotics. They, they, as, as I said, they expand your uh, domain of physical ability, right? They help you to satisfy the needs without involving other people. What does that mean? It, that expands the physical domain of your identity. It's a little difficult. Maybe it's a little difficult for some of you, but I hope your parents will help you to elaborate it later. Same for the AR and VR and video games. They expand what you can feel, what you can see, what you can think. They expand your mental world, that the world that you perceive, that you feel. And in, because it's not the real world, you can satisfy the needs without having real consequences. You can commit tons of crime in a video game, but you're not affected by it in the real world. Or, you, or not only for the bad things, you can do a lot of good things in a video game, but you don't have any kind of real consequences. Anyhow, you get satisfied because you can do the things that you cannot do in the real world. In such ways, Video games and AR VR contents help you to expand, to extend your presentation. The, 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 the I that I think, the I that I feel. And we know that, we, we know what that talks about. It focuses only truly on yourself. Uh, from, from the long experience in churches, you have heard that is the main point of state, state of Genesis 3, 6, 11. State of being focused only on yourself, only on your needs, only on your, on your personal world. And what does that mean? What you depend on, the technologies, the contents, or anything else, drugs, alcohol, whatever, gambling, that comes from the struggle to find or to compensate or to make the, the lost identity because you cannot just uh, go, go with it. You cannot go live with the lost sense of identity. And from that, it's very evident it's very actual that all the technologies are basically platforms for what? To deliver some kind of message. 
Why? Because identity is built on message. Identity is built on what you heard. We know the Bible verse. You believe from what you heard, what you listen. So if you don't have the message, you want to find the message. What does that mean? You don't have the identity. You have a very weak sense of identity. So you want to find or build an identity. Then we must ask ourselves, then what is the message those technologies are giving to you? What is the message that you get from those contents? As we said before, it's Genesis 3, 6, 11. The, the people who made those contents have the same spiritual, have the same identity problems as you. So you want to build a better version of yourself or expand yourself or extend yourself to the digital world. I cannot get satisfied in the real world, so I'll move myself to the digital world. Or I cannot get satisfied with my physical self, so I will better build a better version of myself, which is robots. In other words, all those technologies, all those things that surround us every time can be concluded in three uh, keywords of message, 24, and relations. And you must not ignore them. Then now let's talk about recreation. How we should we make good content? Like uh, from, from that point, like the most obvious question is, well, everything's bad. Everything is made of by the three, gen three, uh, three organizations. How can something be good from them? Well, that's correct, but is everything okay if it's just good? Is everything okay if it's just not evil? Uh, lately, in some high schools in America, they're using Assassin's Creed video game to teach history. Why? Because they reflect the history, historical moments of that time so well. I mean, I mean, uh, even <sighs> you guys, maybe some of you know the Temple of Notre Dame in Paris. And you guys have heard that, that, that the temple got burned down. And French government asked the makers of Assassin's Creed to provide the map of the Temple of Notre Dame because they were able to uh, remake it in a virtual world on a one-to-one -one size, one-to-one -one proportion, as exactly as how it was with all the details. In the same way, uh, some high schools are using this video game, of course, without the violent part, to teach the history of Egypt, Rome, and other ancient civilization. And another example about the things that the contents, how they are made by three organizations, but not in an evil way. I would like to show you this video. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen. And I am nine and a half years old. So Owen was born with a rare genetic disorder called Escobar Syndrome. He's had 33 surgeries to date. I love video games, my friends, my family, and again, video games. It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. Everyone can play. And you can just say, all right, that's that button, that's that button, that's that button. Perfect. One of the biggest fears early on is, how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> He's not different when he plays. No matter. What's that evil? <laughs> That's made by Microsoft, one of the most representative of the three organizations. But what's that evil? I'm pretty sure nobody can say that. It's good. But then is it okay? Is it okay to have them? That's another question. The true question we must ask is, how come there's no gospel contents? How come there's no VR ro robots or uh, video games made based on the gospel? Actually, and you might ask, is there really no gospel contents? And yeah, there's no. 
there's not. From the 60 or around 60, 70 years of video games, his video game history, there's only one Christian game so far. I'm not saying gospel game, it's a Christian game. It's a game called Black Dragon Cancer. It's about uh, this father on the right uh, on his story about how he was able to uh, follow how God um, soothed him when he found out that his, his son was dying from cancer. So it's uh, well, it's a very touching story. It, it shows the struggles and those mental um, difficulties that, that can be exper experienced as a father. But is it gospel content? I'm not sure. And you might ask, okay, but there's going to be some kind of Bible-related games. There are, but they're really bad. Like, you have a, I mean, I made a short research and I was so embarrassed to even present them. Like there are, there is like a Bible game called Super Noah, which is basically rip off of Super Mario, Super Mario, which just instead of Mario, there's Noah running down the street. Or like there is a, a Jesus Palm, which is a basically rip off of any Palm, just like a Candy Crush saga with, 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 with the face of Jesus, that's all. And, and that's the current situation of Christian games we have. Not even gospel, just Christian games. But there's so many things that people make for fun. It's a field of everybody, really. Every, every year we have around like thousands, tens of thousands of video games, tens of thousands of VR, AR, movies, whatever, whatsoever. How about when it, when it comes to the question of true gospel contents, that is a field of nobody. Nobody does that. Nobody even tries that. But we have seen from the Bible that God always uses his remnants to conquer the main culture of that age. For example, let's, let's look at how Joseph, let's look at the example of Joseph. Uh, why God used dream reading for uh, about, well, why God gave him the talent of reading dreams. Uh, because uh, the, 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 the picture on your right is a manuscript of the dream interpreting dictionary that was made in the time of Pharaoh Ramses II. It shows that dream reading culture was the most popular thing to entertain the people in that time. It basically was uh, like today's like uh, America's got Calendar or something. And because that was so popular, that was the main culture of the world, God has used it. God has sent Joseph to conquer the culture. What about Moses? Um, I guess you have, you have seen the, the Prince of Egypt, right? And it shows that like he, Moses had to deal with uh, tons of magicians, tons of wizards or pharaohs. And that's historically correct. Magic shows were the most popular means of entertainment in the times of Moses. And that's why God has sent Moses and sent and showed the miracles to show that the, the main culture, that things that you like so much are meaningless or powerless in front of God. For the same applies to David why God gave David talent to praise and talent to be a such a wise general, such a good general who can lead the army. Because there was a time when Israel needed, uh, Israel was in need of such commander. Music always accompanied in front of the army, especially in the Israel army, because that was God's command. The, 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 the group of, of uh, musicians who praise God must be in the front row of the army, leading the whole army. That's why God gave Davis such talents. So then 
it's obvious God will use our remnants to conquer the, the, the main cultures of this world, then what should we ask ourselves? How should we find what we truly like? How should we prepare ourselves? Begin from studying yourself, begin from analyzing yourself, what you really like for fun. Why do you find it fun? Is, that, is there anything you do to feel the fun? And do you really know yourself? Do you really believe that you're a child of God? If you do that, if you ask that question, God will, be, God will eventually lead you. Just believe in the gospel. Not in the power of gospel, not in the word of gospel, just gospel itself. So I wanted to conclude with, uh, well, this is also my covenant, Isaiah 43, 21. The people I form for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. God has made us so we could proclaim his praise. God has given us the content already from the day we, he made us. So what you have to do? Find your content. Recreate it with, your God, with the God and relate to other people. That's, that's the main thing I wanted to relay all of you. And that's the way I think to escape from the addiction problem. Uh, thank you for listening. And we still have sh uh, a few minutes, but if you have any questions, I only really have. Well, happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for joining. Uh, thank you for joining us. And... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Do you think you would ever, uh, are you in the process or thinking of creating a video game or a content? Uh, yeah, so the reason why I'm in the field of psychology is to be able to help those kinds of people who want to make contents. So, because, you know, like uh, there are so many singers, there are so many movie actors that struggle from, from psychological problems. And I thought that studying psychology will help me to uh, get in contact with them and I'm also well making a short videos on what I'm thinking and so on and uh, I well yeah I'm hoping for that how can we um, get exposure to the content that you create uh, so there's a there's a YouTube channel JHCA <laughs> Yeah, it's a small channel and it's mostly in Korean right now. No. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, yes, Shania, I'll send you the PowerPoint. Um please write the email address on it, please. You can you can send send the private message too. Okay, um, yeah. All right, so this is, this is our time and thank you, thank you everyone for joining this, joining my session. And um, I hope you be, to be feeling, to be filled with the grace in the next, uh, until the last day of the RCA. Thank you. <laughs>